the first principle is to make it easy for your affiliates to make money. So upfront, mm -hmm. it's like really understanding how an affiliate is going to think about promoting your product. The other aspect of it is that it should be relevant to their audience. But, you know, there's a lot of products out there for affiliates to try and sell. And so they're going to focus on the one that's easiest. Run your program professionally. It's to give a damn about your affiliate program and not to treat it like it said it and forget it, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you want your affiliates to feel like there's actually somebody who manages this affiliate program. You want to be proactively and constantly looking to find new partners that you're going to try and bring into your affiliate program within that principle. Every SaaS company plays for high stakes, but what does it take to dominate the market right now? Welcome to Paris Talks Marketing, the podcast where we dive deep into the latest trends and strategies in SaaS marketing that are really working today. I'm your host, Paris, and our guests are SaaS CMOs, founders, and specialists, and we discuss one trendy topic in the industry per episode. Ready to unlock the true power of marketing strategy? In this theme, we'll explore the world of cutting edge marketing strategies and tactics that are shaking up the SaaS industry. We'll share insights on testing new tactics and uncover the latest developments from digital landscape giants like Google, Facebook, and LinkedIn. We'll also explore how AI is revolutionizing the digital landscape and transforming marketing tactics. So grab your headphones and get ready for a marketing strategy masterclass with Paris Talks Marketing. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Paris Talks Marketing. Today, my guest is Emmett Gibney. Emmett is the CEO of Rewardful, which is an all-in-one affiliate marketing software for businesses using Stripe or Paddle for payments. Rewardful was founded in 2018, and it's fast forward to today, it has thousands of customers all over the world. Emmett, welcome to the show. Paris, thanks for having me. Sure. I'd like to start with a myth-busting question. Can you help us identify a very common myth or misconception around affiliate marketing? And can you help us bust that one wide open? Yeah, sure. So I think one of the most common, I don't know if it's a, a myth or I might phrase it as kind of like a misconception about affiliate marketing that we see a lot of our customers come to us with is this perception that affiliate marketing is some sort of like a set it, forget it marketing channel. And you know, I, I don't know if if maybe that comes sort of like the olden days of affiliate marketing where, you know, people might throw like an ebook up on ClickBank and, you know, make money or something like that. I, I'm not sure exactly where it comes from, but it certainly isn't the case. And the more effort you put into your affiliate program, like any other marketing channel, the better results that's going to yield. And so that's one of the first things that I try to disabuse our incoming customers of is this notion that you can kind of just set up an affiliate program and people are magically going to find your program and start sending you customers. So yeah, I'd say that's the biggest myth that we come across in our industry. Great. That kind of reminds me of SEO because I've repeated that maybe hundreds of times over the years is that SEO also is not a set it and forget it channel. And I think there's also a common misconception that quote unquote, you can fix your SEO in your website and then you're done. And then you're, you're going to get the benefits of that over the next years potentially. And yeah. I think it's clear also with affiliate marketing and the way it has evolved since the early days of, I remember ClickBank and Commission Junction, I suppose they're still yeah. around are, those yeah. big names. But that was, to me, that was more of a time when I guess SEO and affiliate marketing were really a great way to make money online. This is probably 15 or 20 years ago where you could become an affiliate and, and out market with SEO. And in, in the really early days with Black Hat SEO, you yeah. could out market and outrank the actual brand that you're partnering with yeah. and kind of intercept a lot of their, a lot of their customers. Um, but now it's a whole different game. And how has affiliate marketing really changed in the last, say, 10 years? Well, I think what I would might speak to is how it's changed within SaaS. So I, I get the sense when you look back to when Rewardful was started, the guys, Colin Brady, who, who started Rewardful, they were really surfing a wave of Stripe. You know, Stripe is kind of like the go-to platform for SaaS businesses to mm -hmm. set up their, their payments. And I think in the early days of, of Stripe, you know, it's still quite hard for SaaS businesses to get up and running and Stripe really helped with that. 
Um, but in the earlier days, setting up affiliate programs for SaaS companies was challenging because of recurring billing. And a lot of the older affiliate tracking platforms relied on triggering JavaScript on like a thank you page. It was really around like e-commerce and mm -hmm. um, information products and things like that. There were one-off purchases. Trans transactional, so, not recurring. Yeah. Yeah, e exactly. Right. And so I think also like, like you're talking about like the earlier days of affiliate marketing and, sa and SEO, it was a little bit cowboyish, like a little bit wild, wild west. Like there's a lot of kind of black hat stuff going on in SEO. And then in affiliate marketing, I think there was some similarities where you know, there's definitely a lot of aspects of affiliate marketing that are even back then were very much above board, but there was definitely sort of an area within affiliate marketing where there was similar to SEO, you might say kind of black hat, black hat type behavior and the types of products that were being, were being sold. There was reasons to, you know, to have questions around the industry, maybe in the earlier mm -hmm. days because of some of the products and things that were being sold. And the methods some of the marketers might've been using were a little bit more black hat or, or gray hat. And I think the FTC actually came in and to, to address a lot of that behavior in the, the US. And so I think fast forward to, let's say like the, the mid 20 teens, whatever we call that decade, I'm not sure. And I think there was still a little bit of a like hangover within SaaS marketers who would have viewed themselves as being much more sort of above board professional, maybe a little bit less ag aggressive in some of the tactics that I think there was a little bit of a perception that affiliate marketing had a, was a bit distasteful or, you know, not for, for SaaS. I also don't think that it helped that technically it was, it was harder because of, you know, the lack of tools that were available for recurring subscription commissioning models. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's probably the biggest thing that has started to change in the last call, it like five to eight years, if you go from like sort of the middle of the de last decade where we're starting to see like Silicon Valley, you know, funded software startups, hundreds of millions in, in revenue coming to our, you know, knocking at our door, looking to set up affiliate programs. And so I think the perception within SaaS marketing circles is that this is, you know, a totally legit channel in a way that maybe people would have kind of looked down on or kind of dismissed affiliate marketing for SaaS previously. So I think that's sort of the biggest shift in terms of attitude towards uh, the practice. Yeah. Let's hone in more on, on SaaS companies. And can you boil it down to three things, three tips or pieces of advice that you would give to a SaaS company that is looking to either launch or start to scale an affiliate marketing program? Yeah. So we actually have three principles that we try to articulate to customers that if you can adhere to or live up to these these principles, you're going to have a much better chance in terms of building a successful affiliate program. A lot of this is is pretty common sense, but common sense, people don't always necessarily follow it, right? Like um, most things in life. Yeah. Like most things in life, exactly, right? And so the, the first principle is to make it easy for your affiliates to make money. So upfront, mm -hmm. it's like really understanding how an affiliate is going to think about promoting your product. And ultimately, they want to make money. And if it's hard to make money for a variety of different reasons, and I can go into that in a moment, but if it's hard for them to make money, they're going to move on to something else. You know, they've got a, a website or, or some sort of traffic source that they're looking to monetize. And, you know, to a certain extent, like they're looking for low hanging fruit. What's the, the easiest way I'm going to be able to monetize this traffic? The other aspect of that, which is very much related to that, is that it should be relevant to, to their audience. But, you know, there's a lot of products out there for affiliates to, to try and sell. And so they're going to focus on the one that's easiest. So that's, that's the first principle is you need to make it easy for your affiliates to make money. They're looking for, you know, the easiest way to, to make money. And, and we can dive into, you know, what that, what that really looks like and what that means in a, in a moment. The second principle that we're trying to get people to adhere to is to run your program professionally. And to boil this down, maybe to say this in more plain terms, it's to to give a damn about your, your affiliate program and not to treat it like it said it and forget it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you want your affiliates to feel like there's actually somebody who manages this affiliate program. If there's questions that come up, they can talk to you and, uh, you know, ask for advice and that they get paid on time. And, you know, just like the basic blocking mm -hmm. and tackling of running an affiliate program. And a lot of, a lot of that, again, is just very kind of like common sense stuff that most people don't do because they're just leaving affiliates to their own devices and not giving them resources and not paying them on time or in a regular cadence or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then the third principle is to build an affiliate recruitment system or a machine, basically. And 
I want to be careful not to give people the impression that this is like an automated system that you're going to set it and forget it. It's more mm -hmm. about having a process that you follow on a regular recurring basis to go out and find more affiliates. And again, it's to this idea of it's not a set it and forget it channel. You, you want to be proactively and constantly looking to find new partners that you're going to try and bring into your, your um, affiliate program. Within that principle, again, there's, there's a lot of stuff right. that, that goes into that in terms of, you know, how to go out and how to go out and do that. But mm -hmm. uh, put very simply, it's to be consistently going out and looking for new affiliates to join your affiliate program. So yeah. those are kind of like the, the three main principles that we try to get people to adhere to. And mm -hmm. if you do, you know, you'll probably have a pretty good chance of having a, a successful uh, affiliate program. Great. Emmett, for the SaaS companies that are the most successful in building out the affiliate channel into something that has significant revenue contribution, does it often entail getting a dedicated affiliate manager in the company? Or do you sometimes see other marketing functions cover the affiliate program? What are, what are some of the best ways to, to build a team or to staff this for success? So we, I, I think you could kind of boil it down to three different sort of categories. So the first would be, it's like an indie hacker where they're doing everything. You know, it's like they're doing, they're building the product, they're doing the marketing and, you know, they're also managing like their, their affiliate program. So like, there's not even mm -hmm. a dedicated marketer on the team that's going to manage, manage the affiliate program yeah. uh, in a lot of cases. And so we've got some subset of our customer base that's like that, where they're a solopreneur, indie hacker. Yeah. And, so know, it's the marketing the jack of all trades. And exactly. I imagine that affiliate marketing is, is probably far down the priority list for someone like that. Oftentimes. And, and you mm -hmm. know, we'll have people like that. And, and then the complaint is, you know, the program's not growing and it's, they're not putting any time into it. So yeah. that's, that's one category where it's like they're doing everything. Um, and they don't even have a dedicated marketer. The second category would be they have a, a dedicated marketer or a marketing team but they don't have a specialist affiliate marketing manager. I would say that's more common than having a dedicated affiliate marketing manager, which would be the third category is they actually have someone who's a professional affiliate marketer. That's their, their bread and butter. And what you'll find if that's like a spectrum, you know, from jack of all trades does everything, including, you know, product development as well as marketing through to a dedicated affiliate manager, the further towards jack of all trades, that's probably the, the more likely use case within, within our mm -hmm. customer base. That's starting to shift a little bit. We're starting to see more sort of larger companies come in and start using Rewardful, um, mm -hmm. where they'll have sort of like, you know, a dedicated uh, affiliate manager. And I think what you'll find is the further down the spectrum you go towards dedicated affiliate manager, the mm -hmm. more likely they are to be successful with their affiliate program because they're going to invest more time and, yeah, absolutely. Um, and energy into developing the program. Over the life cycle of a SaaS company, when you think about their marketing maturity, when does affiliate marketing really start to get serious consideration and budget? Because I imagine that a company starts out by really first focusing on the product and making sure they nail product market fit. Then maybe they'll, they'll raise some money and they'll start thinking about marketing and scaling. And maybe they'll think about performance marketing, paid search, bottom of the funnel. And then later, maybe they'll think a little bit about mid to upper funnel stuff where they'll, they'll try to build up SEO and organic traffic. They'll start working on branding. Mm -hmm. And then, then maybe affiliate marketing comes in, but where for, for the life cycle of a marketing maturity, when does affiliate marketing first really get on the radar screen of most SaaS companies at what stage? So I think there's actually, there's two, two questions actually in there. Um, so one is the maturity stage of, of the business's marketing function. And then the other is actually around the funnel and where affiliate marketing sits within a funnel. I'll answer that second question first. So um, Thank you for, actually, for taking my question and simplifying it. I, th I think that was a little wordy there, but that's exactly what I what I was meaning to ask. Yeah. And so so in terms of where it fits within the marketing funnel, um, it's, it can be at all sort of stages within the funnel, right? So it depends on the types of affiliates that you're you're working with, and so certain types of affiliates and the type of traffic that they're going to send you is going to exist at different places within the funnel, right? And so if you're working with sort of what people would typically call an influencer or a thought leader that are operating on social, it's higher up the funnel, right? Like if you work with a, let's say like a TikToker, we see a lot of that now. People, oh, I want to work with, I want to work with TikTokers because a lot of mm -hmm. hype around that, right? But the reality is like the content that people are engaging with, the way in which you're engaging with that kind of content, it's like they're just swiping through TikTok. Yeah. Not, so you might get a lot of traffic. They, they do some review video of your 
AI product or whatever, right? And it gets like a million views and you, you get a lot of traffic out of that, let's say. These people are on the bus or, you know, they're waiting in line at the grocery store and they're just kind of mindlessly scrolling, trying to kill time. They're not in buying mode. And so those types of affiliates are going to send you maybe a lot of traffic, but it's like high up the funnel, low intent, low conversion rate type of mm -hmm. traffic, right? Yeah. But then you might, you might work with an affiliate who has, let's say like a SaaS review site where they review different SaaS products and most of their traffic is through yeah, high, in, talk. high intent keywords. You mm -hmm. know, someone like for us, it's like SaaS affiliate tracking tool. It's like, that's, that's pretty spot on the nose for, you know, what we'd like to rank highly for. Mm -hmm. And so an affiliate who's getting, sending traffic to us from there, that's much lower down the funnel that, yeah. you know, maybe lower volume, but very high intent, probably high conversion rate. Yeah, that's going to be high quality traffic. Yeah. And so there's the full spectrum, right? Where affiliates can exist. Sure. You know, at, at different points in, in the funnel. And it can also depend on the types of, like the size of the customers and the way they buy. So like if you have, maybe it's a higher ticket item, people need more time yeah, to do their so research. Cool. Yeah. You might mm -hmm. have an affiliate send people not directly to your signup page, but you might have them send it to like a lead magnet where there's, you know, lead nurturing email mm -hmm. sequence you're sending out. Yeah. And so, so that's more maybe middle, middle of funnel. Yeah, exactly. And so um, just as an aside, if you do that, you'll probably want to have like a longer cookie window because your affiliates are going to be worried. Like, is the cookie going to expire if it's a longer sales cycle? Mm -hmm. So to answer this, the, the second sort of question, it's they, anywhere in, in the funnel effectively, depending on the types of affiliates you're working with. But in tandem, I guess, with the first question in terms of where you would sequ sequentially have affiliate marketing fit in, within affiliate marketing, there's kind of a sequence of what you'd want to focus on. Like you probably want to focus on those higher intent type aff affiliate traffic first, as opposed to the, the influencers. It can vary depending on the space you're in. Like if there's just a lot of heat in, in your space and there's a lot of talkers, you know, looking to, to promote you, maybe it's worth kind of trying that if they're open to affiliate deals. But you probably want to start with the high intent stuff, right? Like mm -hmm. review sites and people who have content sites that are getting SEO related traffic that's from high intent keywords and then mm -hmm. move your way up, you know, up the funnel accordingly. Yeah, in that term, makes a lot of sense. In terms of when to think about, okay, when should I implement an, a, an affiliate program into, you know, a nascent marketing function within a SaaS business, we've seen businesses launch the, their business using affiliate marketing. But it is definitely a harder way to launch an affiliate. It's harder to launch an affiliate program and a business at the same time. It's mm -hmm. much easier to launch an affiliate program to a business that is already operating, already has revenues. You've already established that the product is some people, something people want. You have some semblance mm -hmm. of product market fit because affiliates, they're just traffic, right? And that traffic might be at different places in the funnel, if like higher yep. or lower, but it's just traffic. And so... If you don't have product market fit yet, if, if you don't have a product people want to buy, if your funnel converts poorly, there's all these different things you're trying to figure out in the initial stages of launching a SaaS business. And if you have that is not dialed in at all, then like affiliates aren't going to solve that for you. And mm -hmm. they might just, you know, get frustrated and, and stop promoting you anyway, because they're like, oh, I'm just going to move on to something else that actually sells. That's again, to that whole thing of the first principle, you know, make it easy for your affiliates to make money. And yeah. if you don't have product market fit yet, or, you know, they're going to, they're going to get, they're going to get frustrated, but we definitely have customers who, and one of our case studies on our website is a company called Cometly and they launched the business using affiliate marketing. Mm -hmm. And I think in the first week they had done first week or two weeks, they had done like 250 or 230,000 in, in gross sales. And then mm -hmm. came away with that with like $54,000 in monthly recurring revenue. And so I don't know the exact specifics in terms of how they did things. I, I imagine they probably had beta users and had figured out like, okay, we've, we've got the product right. And we, we know that people want to use this and we've got, we've had great feedback. And so there's a certain level of confidence that this is some people, something people are going to want in the market. Mm -hmm. And then also my understanding was they launched with a pre-existing relationship someone who was mm -hmm. some sort of thought leader within their space who had an existing audience and source of traffic that they could send them. Um, and it was like one or two of these types of affiliates that had a pre existing relationship. So you can launch a business using affiliate marketing, but it's definitely, the, it's definitely hard mode. And you want to make sure that you've got these things in place, like a product that people actually want 
and you've got a couple of partners that have got relevant traffic that they can send you. Mm -hmm. If you don't have product market fit and you're like, who's going to promote me? Yeah. It's, really, it's harder, right? It's, it's harder. But it, 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 to the answer, you know, really it comes down to like, it depends. It, it depends on sure. your circumstance. Yeah. Um, it's definitely yeah. easier if you've already got some semblance of, of um, revenue coming in. Yeah. I mean, in general, I think there are some, some big benefits of starting it earlier rather than later. One is that if, if you're strapped for a marketing budget, like so many SaaS companies are right now, yeah. you can effectively parlay or, or double down on your SEO efforts by creating even more unique content that you can supply to affiliates. And then you're, you're, you're paying them out of revenue. So it doesn't require a, a big marketing budget, certainly not a paid advertising marketing budget. Exactly. It might, it might make you have to expand your content marketing budget and your resources. Yeah. But to talk to me about the, the role, the, the importance of providing unique content to affiliates to enable them to sell better. Yeah. So it, it depends on the nature of the affiliates you're working with and the, the type of content that they're already creating, right? So if they've got like a review site or, you know, it's like they're a thought leader with the website where they talk about different products as opposed to just a strict review site, or if they're a TikToker or whatever. The biggest thing is you want to make it easy for them to distill down to their audience what your product is and what it does and why people should care. And so you you need to have content that's created that's very clear in terms of your messaging and positioning and, you know, what your product does, like product demo videos and, and that kind of stuff. I've seen people where they've created sort of like, if you want to call it almost like white label demos or reviews. And so it's like yep. a walkthrough of, of the product that highlights so you're, you're kind of giving your affiliate a script. I mean, they need to shoot the video, but you give them a script. to do Yeah. The or like it, it could be raw video that they then edit down. Like it's just like literally right. a walkthrough of, of the product so they can, they can see how it works. Um, yeah. cause part of the challenge is for, for some products, Rewardful has, has this challenge is that, um, until you've got data in there, the product is hard to like review. Right. And so, yeah, you basically, you, you need to give them ammunition in terms of, you know, how they're going to create some sort of content around your, your product. Um, yeah. So like demoing the product and having some sort of content that they can work with, that's big. This isn't literally content, but, you know, giving them access to your product. So give them, you know, a two month trial or, or whatever, right? Yeah. So they can actually poke around and have a sense of what your product does. Mm -hmm. And then one tactic that is quite effective, and this is actually something that um, Kit, uh, have talked about publicly before for their affiliate program that they did to great success. And just mm -hmm. to maybe a bit of background context, ConvertKit's affiliate program was a huge part of their success is my understanding. And it, they publicly said this, I think something like 20 or 30% of their revenue comes from their, their affiliate program. And what they did was they would do webinars with affiliates. And, and so earlier on, yeah, when I was, nice I was talking, talking about like, lead magnets and have affiliates send traffic to lead magnets. Instead of lead magnets, magnets, it could be webinars, right? So registration forms for webinars, you drop a cookie, and then you have the, the affiliate who's some sort of, you know, thought leader or influencer within a community, and you've got some, you know, product expert within your team. You come mm -hmm. together, you host a, a webinar together, and it basically allows you to have their fairy dust rub off on you effectively, right? Like, they come to that webinar with credibility with an audience of people and you've got product knowledge and expertise within a, within a space. And because this person that they know and trust is there, customers are more likely to buy from you. Because, yeah, um, sure. You know, it makes a lot there. of sense. And so wow. you could do that as like a live webinar that's and then record it and then share it mm -hmm. on a pre-recorded basis. And so like, that's a big investment and you know, you're not going to do that for thousands of affiliates, but you might pick your you know, top 10 affiliates that've got a big audience, you might do this type of content with them and then re record it so that you can share that pre-recorded afterwards. But that's, that's definitely, that's definitely. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great yeah. format. I really like that. And since most SaaS companies have uh, lots of integrations with larger platforms, and a lot of times they have those integrations yep. published on a page, would those integrators make good initial affiliate partners, either for co-branded webinars or other types of things where if I integrate really well with HubSpot, as an example, yep. you know, if it was possible, I mean, if I could co-host co a webinar with HubSpot, have them yep. become an affiliate off of that webinar, and then I can tout, because then, then I can tout the integration, HubSpot can come at it with, from their angle. And then, as you said, the, the fairy dust, I mean, you really, you're really trying to, to leverage the, the brand equity of the larger integration partner 
I want to come back to something that you mentioned about review sites. The first one that pops to mind is G2. But to my knowledge, G2 does not partner uh, to do any affiliate partnerships with any of its no, SaaS. No, yeah, right? so th- no. Yeah, so like G2, Captera, there'd be a couple big ones in sort of the SaaS mm-hmm. space. And what you'll find with review sites is the bigger ones are just going to want to like pay me, pay me up, pay me up front for like the really big ones. And that's like all they do kind of thing. They're going to say like, you know, pay me, we're going to hire someone to do a review and they're, you know, they're not going to do affiliate deals. And so I would, I would say I would focus on like the long tail, the long tail ones, as opposed to like the, the really established ones, because like, it's just a, it's a different business model. I think like the, the larger yes. review sites they're you know, they're kind of like, um, what I would describe as like digital toll roads. They've kind of positioned themselves on, on top of, you know, popular keywords and um, yeah. extracting their monopoly rents in, in sort of based on their position. So, yeah. Now, a quick word from our sponsor. The Paris Talks Marketing Show is affiliated with Hop Online, a performance marketing agency focused on high growth SaaS and other recurring revenue based companies. If you like the flow of this conversation, you may want to consider jumping on a discovery call with someone at Hop Online. A discovery call is similar to my podcast interviews in a lot of ways. We'll get to know your business goals, competitive landscape, and marketing needs. And you'll almost certainly come away with some new ideas for how to accelerate your customer and revenue growth. If you're interested, go to hop.online, that's hop, H-O-P dot online, and book a discovery call with one of our strategists today. Now, back to the episode. Do you think G2 is missing a massive revenue opportunity by not being an affiliate? Because um, they could still, they sell the intent data, but I don't think that is a conflict with also being an affiliate, or, but maybe it is, I don't know. I don't know an, enough about sort of their their numbers and sort of the core of their their business model to have a super informed opinion. I, I imagine mm-hmm. I imagine that they probably have done the math and, and figured out that like, there's a couple of things. One, either they've done the math and seem like actually we, we can make more money on a per click basis by just charging, you know, whatever model they're currently charging, mm-hmm. or they, they feel that it, it could call into question sort of the objectivity of, of their platform, yeah. you know, if, because not all, pla- not all of their, you know, their customers or reviewed products are going to have affiliate programs. And so if they're making yeah. more money off of some, I, I think there's, I mean, not to pick on them too much, but I think like a lot of these review sites, there's, there's already questions about the objectivity Lots of, bias. Oh, yeah. of, you yeah. know, that cause you can like pay more money and get better listing and all this kind of stuff. So I, I think there's probably questions there already, but um, yeah, I, G2, I G2 is really following the Gartner, Gartner style, the, the grids that they have. And I think these need to be very, very unbiased and objective. So maybe yeah. that's why they're, they're not doing it. To, it would, it would degrade the perceived quality, but I think it's a yeah. massive revenue opportunity because I think so many SaaS purchase decisions go through G2 at some stage, yeah. usually later stages of, of that, of that buyer's journey. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And let's talk about attribution and tracking because I think this is sometimes a challenge for affiliate marketers. And well, what what is a typical length of, of a cookie life? Or maybe you can help us help our audience understand what that even means. But if somebody clicks on, if, if I'm an affiliate and somebody clicks on my link and they don't directly purchase, but they might later do some more research uh, through Google, they might click on a paid ad. But yep. they're still going to convert, uh, let's say, on day twenty-eight. But it's not the last click. Does my do I still earn revenue for that, or how how does that work? Yeah, it depends on on how Merchant has set up their program. So I'd have to double check, but I believe our default is thirty days for a cookie mm-hmm. length. But customers can you know configure that as they see fit. It really depends on sort of like their business case and and the industry they're in. So I could be wrong, but I feel like e-commerce might be shorter. Uh, or I don't know, we don't deal a lot in e-commerce, so I, I could be misquoting here. You know, I, I think it depends on sort of like the sales cycle, as it were, for the for mm-hmm. the product. So like, I'm taking a guess here, but I would I would imagine something like, I don't know, a CRM system or something like this, that it's like a system of record. It's like a really important sort of, yeah, it's, it really it's probably a, a longer months. sales yeah. cycle because you're doing more homework and trying to figure out what you want to do. Whereas something like a testimonial collection tool, you know, it's probably like yeah. a shorter sales cycle, right? And uh, so we have a customer of ours is uh, testimonial.to and we're a customer of theirs as well, actually. We use we use them. And so 
I don't know what his, you know, his cookie window is, but he could probably get away with having a shorter cookie window than somebody else who's like, you know, mm -hmm. a more, not enterprise, but like, you know, a sort of a, a more core tool, like a CRM or something like that. In the end, it, it really is just like a subtle or unofficial negotiation with your affiliates. Like there's all these mm -hmm. different terms that you can set in terms of how your affiliate program is going to work. How long is the cookie going to last? How much are you going to pay in terms of a, let's say a percentage of commission? Is it limited or recurring in perpetuity in terms of the commissions? There's all these different terms that you can set and the more favorable you make it for the affiliate, yeah. the more, the easier it is for them to make money. Back to that first principle, make it easier for yep. them to make money. Yeah. And so if your product converts poorly, then maybe you, ne you need to be more generous in some of these other terms. But if it converts yeah. really well and it's a high ticket item, then you can maybe be a bit more stingy with some of these other terms. Yeah. Emmett, what is the average commission that you see across your customer base? I would say, I don't know what the average is, but certainly the anecdotally, the range we see and we recommend is between 20 and 30% recurring commission. Recurring? Um, what, recur lifetime? Not, not um, cap? I, either lifetime or 12 months is, a, okay. is, is another common one. Um, and again, it's it's kind of like, it's sort of this unspoken negotiation with with your affiliates, the the more favorable the, the more enthusiastic they're going to be about promoting your product. Yeah. The big thing that we're working on right now that I have high hopes for, we'll see how it pans out, is a video course. And so I was talking before about this idea of lead magnets for kind of like, mm -hmm. you know, mid funnel or higher up the funnel type activity. And mm -hmm. um, this will be sort of the first sort of, if you want to call it like tentpole or, or marquee sort of lead magnet that we're creating. It's a, sort of a foundational course for affiliate marketing for SaaS. And um, we're hoping to have that done in um, in the new year. And so that's something nice. that we can we can send sort of lower intent traffic to that maybe need a little bit more nurturing and education. Yeah, earlier stage. Yeah, exactly. Are you gonna put that up on Udemy or YouTube or, or both? Or uh, no, we're gonna partners? we're gonna gate it. So okay, um, we've still, we've got we're still figuring out like the the mechanism for delivering it. We've been looking at um, a few different course platforms. But uh, actually, the one I've been looking at lately was actually an integration partner of ours called MemberStack, which will Member allow Stack, us to yeah. gate content on our own Webflow site and like allows us to capture custom fields. So uh, some of the other platforms I'd looked at, if we wanted to use it, so right now we don't do any sales, but if we wanted to start capturing basically lead data to you know segment a lot of these these course platforms just email e name an email and that doesn't really help you much but if we wanted to understand yeah. like what industry are you in what's the size of your company these different types of of pieces of information to understand who's interested in this member stack allows us to to capture that kind of information so that's a, a big initiative that we're working on yeah this looks really cool i'm, I'm checking out a uh, member stack i wasn't aware of them yeah that looks great yeah i think um i think course content is great too because you can uh, you can use a lot of a lot of your educational content. It's it's just a really nice format for that stage of the of the journey where people might be yeah. maybe aware of affiliate marketing, maybe curious about it. They're ready for it, but they still need to understand more about what it is and how to make it work. That that's the perfect type of content for that. For that, there's, there's a confidence element, right? Like a lot of people, like so people who are either like in the funnel and haven't purchased, um, but who or maybe they're down the funnel and they've purchased. Um, mm -hmm. There's a confidence element, like. The number one reason that people will churn is because they sign up and they're like, oh, but I don't know what to do next. And so we've yeah. got a lot of people asking us. So from a customer success perspective, it's it's helpful as well to be able to educate your customers on best practice and and that, and that kind of stuff. So, you know, for yeah. that that first segment of customers I was talking about before where, you know, the indie hacker, you know, jack of all trades who doesn't have a professional marketer on their team to have some education to help them build some confidence and skills you know, it's yeah. really helpful, not just marketing, but, you know, also customer success. Yeah. Well, Emmett, as we, as we start to wrap up here, I want to maybe ask you some, some bigger picture questions. And the first is what excites you most about the future, either in your industry, SaaS in general, could be AI related. What's really getting you out of bed in the morning most these days? Yeah. Well, what's getting me, <laughs> what's getting me out of bed most these mornings is, uh, is my toddler, um, uh -huh. you know, he, he's, uh, he's what gets me, him and my, my three-year-old. So I've got two small kids that that's what gets me out of the, out of bed in the morning. But, but, uh, you know, in all seriousness, in terms of like work, you know, what, what brings me to my desk and it gets me excited. And then even more broadly, what, what's kind of caught my eye lately, like building rewardful is, is, is quite enjoyable. And we're, 
you know, the team is, is performing well and, and the business is growing and um, there's still, I think, a lot of low hanging fruit. And uh, in terms of, you know, maybe something more broadly in the industry that's kind of caught my eye lately, like everybody else paying attention to all this, as you said, like this AI stuff that's that's going on. It's super interesting. Um, I think as an industry, tech was desperate for something new after all the kind of crypto stuff didn't really pan out the way that I think a lot of sort of yeah. visionary Web3. types were, were hoping for. Yeah. Like the Web3, you know, it it, it, uh, it didn't really pan out. And, um, you know, there's still, I think, a lot of people that are that are deep into that, hoping that, you know, the new version of the internet is coming. But um, so I think AI coming in has given people a lot of new sort of fresh hope and all that sort of dry powder that the VCs wanted to deploy there. They're looking yeah. to deploy that now into, um, you know, basically subsidizing NVIDIA's future and the sale of GPUs. But um, at the same time, I think, well, it's super interesting, super exciting. I think it's one of those things where the Luddites, I don't think they appreciate how big it's going to be. And then the like techno optimists, I don't think they realize like how long it's going to take to actually filter through and, and change things. I, mm -hmm. I think like in this, maybe every technological sort of cycle has this where it's like, oh, it's going to totally revolutionize everything and change everything and totally disrupt everything. And that ends up being true, but it usually ends up being slower than than people think because yeah. most people are actually very resistant to to change. And so most people will probably end up adopting a lot of these tools via some boring legacy incumbent provider, right? Like most people will probably end up using, you know, some sort of like, generative AI via Photoshop or Microsoft Word or one of these kind of like incumbency tools, as opposed to ChatGPT or, you know, a lot of these other kind of tools. Like in the tech industry, we're very like kind of insular. And so that's something I've I've been kind of thinking about lately is like, it's going to be faster than some most people think and, and slower right. than a lot of us sort of techno optimists might think. Yeah. I started listening to a great podcast called Marketing AI and the the host, and he runs the Marketing AI Institute, um, Paul Roker. He broke it down into four personas. And these are kind of the four different ways people are approaching mindsets that people are approaching this, this massive AI boom right now. The first are the doomsdayers. So these are the people that say, this is a major threat to civilization. This yeah. stuff, if we're not careful, this stuff will become more intelligent than us. And and it could eliminate the, the human race. The second camp are the wild optimists that are saying this this is the third coming of uh, I don't know the, the third big movement in in um, in the digital age. The first being the internet, the second being mobile, and now this is this is number three. And yeah. so these are guys like Mark Andreessen that are, are wildly optimistic about the acceleration of human progress that AI will drive. The third camp are the, the big tech and, and the big tech companies. Are the ones with the most at stake here because these are the yeah. guys that are jostling right now for the future market share and positioning and the, and the, the ownership stakes of this technology. So the open AI and Microsoft and Google and, and Amazon. And these are the ones also uh, ironically pushing for the most regulation uh, at the governmental yeah. level because that regulation capture. Is, yeah, that, that, that's actually going to provide the, the right guard rails and the right structure for them. Barriers to, to entry. Building. Right, yeah, and barriers to entry yeah. so that they can ensure their, their future dominance in, in the space. And then the fourth, and I, I put myself in this fourth camp. It sounds like you do too. These are the realists. And these are the people that are balancing, probably balancing a little bit of the doomsday with, with the wild optimism and yeah. also a little bit wary of big tech's role here. Yeah. But they're the ones that recognize that today this has major implications for, for my team in improving our workflows, improving our productivity. And it also has major promise for the future when we ever reach maybe like this general AI or what, what are they calling it? When, AGI. When it, when AGI, AI. right. Yeah, yeah. AGI, um, yeah. artificial general intelligence. Yeah. And they do see that that is something most likely on the horizon, but they're still a little bit cautious and they're not totally diving in head first, but they are yeah. starting to use it and get benefits from it. Yeah. And I think it's a good way to kind of frame how people are approaching this. Yeah. You, you talk to and hear from all the, all the different camps. Yeah. I think the thing, and not to go too much of a tangent, but I think the thing about like AGI, not that I pontific about this very often or think too deeply about it, but what an AGI or, or maybe AI as it is today lacks that we have, you know, in all these different like, narrow bounds, you can 
that make a, a software algorithm or it could be AI that can perform some narrow task way better than, than a human. And now they've got to the point where it can do that for a lot of text-based written kind of tasks. But what they all lack is motivation. And that's the piece that I think is, is missing. Like we have, we have drives uh, that are at the base of everything we do. Yeah. Um, and that's and, and the piece often that's irrational maybe, too. Yeah. yeah. That's the piece that's scary is, is like, like, I don't, I don't think the concern is the AGI. I think the concern is like whatever drives it's going to have are going to be programmed by people. And so the concern is not AGI. The concern is people that, you know, might be giving the drives to these machines and they're not sentient, you know, they're, they're just, you know, programs written by, by people. Now, maybe that, mm -hmm. you know, betrays a, 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 an ignorance on my part in terms of how these things, these things actually work. But, uh, you know, they're just, they're just objects. There's, there's no drive in them or that's where maybe the danger is, is, you know, how do you, I don't, I don't even know how to like have a mental model for how to think about that. Yeah. Yeah. Supposedly what I've heard also from that podcast is that one of the co-founders, I guess the chief, the CTO of OpenAI right now is already working on putting the guardrails in place for AGI yeah. so that it doesn't, it doesn't go off the rails really. And, and it, yeah. uh, it doesn't get to a point where it could become da dangerous and that humans will always have the ability to rein it in no matter how, how far it advances. I don't know what that entails. It, it sounds naive. like a pretty important <laughs> job though. It feels naive to think that if it's we as can powerful that, as they're concerned, that, that that's actually, I mean, it, it's probably good to be thinking about it, but yeah. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like, I mean, if you're raising a child, you want to make sure that at some, someday, you know, this, this child is going to be able to, to absolutely kick my ass or, or, you know, re really do whatever they want. I'm not going to be able to exert any real authority at some point. So how do I instill the right values in this little yeah, person yeah. today so yeah. that they always respect me and they would never, you know, they would never turn on me when later in life, you know, they could physically overwhelm me or, or dominate me in, in other ways. Yeah. But I don't know, that's got to be a fascinating project to be working on right now. I wonder and, if that's like philosopher or, or what, you know, like it, it kind of goes beyond computer science at that point and more into philosophy. So yeah, yeah, it's, it's really, it's becomes much more moral. Yeah. yeah. Wow. This is great. All right. Emmett, I've got one last question. I promise th this is it. And, and I want to wrap up on maybe a little more of a personal note. And that is what advice would you give to your younger self uh, having maybe just graduated from university and looking back on your career and where you are now, what advice would you give to your 21 year old self? So maybe for some context, when I finished, even before actually I finished university, I started a, a small video production company and we were doing like wedding videos and corporate videos and live event videos and stuff like this. And I had it in my head. So this, this would be advice specifically for people who are interested in entrepreneurship. Cause I had this thing of like, I want to be an entrepreneur and that's the only thing. And I don't want to go get a normal job. And, you know, it was very like, I'm just going to learn everything on my own. And, and was kind of afraid that like, if I got a job, instead of being an entrepreneur, I would get sucked into that. And like, I would, you know, never be an entrepreneur again and, and this kind of thing. And I, I think what I would tell myself is that's wrong. Like you, you, you just cause you get a job, like, you know, you're, you're still like capable of being an entrepreneur. And really the, the reason to get a job at that stage is for the, the learning and, and trying to develop your skills and you can still do whatever you're doing on the side, you know, side projects or entrepreneurial things to develop maybe like a, a stronger sense of agency and initiative because, you know, in, in like entry level jobs, like you don't get a lot of that sort of benefit, right? Like you're kind of doing a bit mm -hmm. of the grunt work. So doing stuff on the side, you're going to, you're going to develop like sort of a, a bigger picture, but to go in and, and work at place that you want to aspire to working in that industry, instead of trying to just kind of go at your own, that would probably be the advice something into that nature, that'd be the advice mm -hmm. I'd, I'd give myself because it's hard to get started as an entrepreneur if you don't, you know, um, have any kind of experience. It's tough to tell that to like a 20 year old who is, you know, arrogant and, you know, ignorant to how the, how the world works. And I mean, fast forward today, like I'm not, I'm not an entrepreneur anymore. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a, a hired gun effectively within Rewardful, but I'm lucky that I'm in a position now where like, despite the fact not, I'm not an entrepreneur, in the technical sense of the word, I have a huge amount of autonomy within. So SaaS groups are our parent company. They give us a huge amount of autonomy and 
room to kind of do what we want. And um, maybe as one last plug, if there's any sort of like SaaS entrepreneurs out there who are looking to sell their business, they should go in and check out SaaS Group because uh, it's a great place to, to work. Cool. Okay, cool. Well, Emma, this has been great. Uh, thanks for hanging in a little longer than usual because we had a great thanks conversation for. today. Can't wait to publish this. And good luck with Rewardful. Everybody out there, especially SaaS listeners, if you haven't yet started an affiliate program, definitely check out Rewardful. If you're doing one but not really happy with how it's going, then also check out Rewardful. Maybe it's time to make the switch. So Emmett, it was great having this conversation today. I'm looking forward to following along in your journey. Thanks, Paris. It was good to chat with you and hopefully we'll catch up soon. Another great episode in the books. Hope you enjoyed it. If you want to get notified when future episodes drop, be sure to subscribe to Paris Talks Marketing on your favorite podcast player. And to learn more about our growth marketing agency, visit hop.online. That's hop, H-O-P dot online. Have a great day.